and it's always a pleasure although it's really late here in brazil it's it's a pleasure to do this effort and it's even more uh interesting that we can do that you know like i don't know 20 years ago it would be impossible to to run something like this and it's it's quite amazing I, i'm here you guys are from on, on the other side of the world you know and we're talking together and maybe we'll be doing like business together it's it's so powerful and that's exactly uh, the topic for tonight we're going to explore a little bit the the exponential organizations framework how you should navigate around it uh, but i'll start with a key piece for us to understand where this exponential growth can come from and i'll share my screen so i can guide you i can guide you on so the first thing we need to understand is that in order for us to grow exponentially and i mentioned that in the first uh in the, in the first event here the first webinar is that we have technologies that grow exponentially and the computer and moore's law which is a which is a study based on on the power of microchips and all this it says that everything that is empowered by uh, a computer can grow exponentially and when we understand which technologies uh, can grow exponentially we need to understand how they grow exponentially and that's really key for us to to grasp and to apply that into our business and the first thing that always happens for uh, technologies to grow exponentially is their digitization. Every technology that has the potential to grow exponentially needs to be on the digital world, okay? Let's take, for example, the camera, the photographic camera. So we had in the past that, that, that film, I don't know if it's from your time, it is from my time, uh, where we had like 24 or 48 shots you could take with your 35 millimeters camera. And then you need to go to a shop and give the film for them. And they would like print uh, that photo for you. So in the 70s, by the end of the 70s, uh, a guy inside Codex Lab uh managed to create uh, an electronic system to capture images and it, it was the first time we spoke about having a digital sensor for making images so the first thing that needs to happen with any ex potential exponential technologies is that they need to be on the digital world okay on the digital realm whether it's a hardware piece just like the sensor whether it's a software piece, uh, let's say like Uber. Because Uber actually digitized what? Uber digitized, you know, when people whistle in, in movies to, to call the cab and they go like this, hey, taxi, I want to ride. So that was exactly what Uber digitized. I don't know if you ever realized that because the mapping, the, the route to make and all this, it, it was already digitized with, with Google Maps and all those uh, geolocation uh, solutions. The payment method was already digitized and everything. So the thing that Uber actually digitized was the way to call the cab, whether it was a phone before or raising your hand and whistling. Uh, that was the exact solution that uber digitized so whether you're we're talking about software whether we're talking about hardware you need to add the digital component to it now the second thing that happens is that we get to a deceptive phase and the deceptive phase of this technology is it goes like this when when the first camera digital sensor came from from codex lab uh, it had like, if I'm not mistaken, 300 by 300 uh, pixels. 
which meant like 0 0.9 kilopixels, like 900,000, no, yeah, 900,000 pixels. It, it, it was like nothing, right? Uh, so as time went by, so the, the, the quality of the image was very bad and you couldn't actually do anything with that, right? So as time go by and, and we're talking about exponential growth, this technology became better and better and better and better. And at some point, it achieved like one megapixel, a million pixels, and then two megapixels, and then four megapixels, and then eight megapixels, and then 16 megapixels, and et cetera. Now, this deceptive phase is really complicated to realize because usually those technologies are, are really weak and we take them for granted. We think about, oh no, that's never going to happen. That's never going to impact my business. Uh, it, it, it would take too much time to, to become like commercial available or, or anything like that. So it took digital cameras almost 30 years from the Kodak Lab and that terrible quality uh, up to two megapixels and start becoming a commercial product. The same thing happened to Uber. When Uber started, the, the first way to, to, to work with Uber, it, it was everything was like manual on the backstage of Uber. So you didn't have like the Google Maps very pretty, you know, and everything connected and apps going on and APIs connecting everything and all this. No, actually, when people were going to request an Uber ride, uh, there was an email sent to the mailbox of the Uber team. Then they needed to call the guys that had cars around the city so they could make the ride, etc. So it, it was very, it, it was a terrible system. It, 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 was, it, it wasn't very good. So this deceptive phase is, is really complicated because we spent years like that. And suddenly at some point when you get to like the two, four megapixel image quality on the camera, when you get to cities like London and now you have everything connected with an API inside your smartphone, uh, that's the point when we start seeing the disruption of the current market. And what usually happens is a very famous phrase from, from Silicon Valley. Uh, it, it's like slowly, then suddenly. So it's slowly that that technology starts to grow, starts to improve, et cetera, and suddenly changes the market. And that's what we really need to, to take care for because it's in like 2020, 14, everybody was talking about Uber. In 2015, taxi drivers were, were, you know, putting fire and beating Uber drivers all over the world. So you see, oh, okay, Uber is never going to take the taxi business. Oh my God, they have taken it. So we need to be very aware of that. Just like Kodak, you know, uh, digital cameras are not that good or they're going to spoil our current uh, business with, with brick and mortar stores and selling uh, films and so on and so forth. And whoa, now everybody has a dig digital camera. Where did our, our business went? That's the real challenge that we have is to really understand this deceptive phase. And let me share with you an example. Uh, let me ask you a question actually. Uh, when did you guys first heard about 3D printing? That would be a nice question to, to, to know. When did you guys first heard about 3D printing? Let me know on the chat, but let me tell you something. The 3D printing was first tried in a lab in the 70s. Yeah, you got that right. The first 3D printing machine was built in the 70s, almost 50 years ago. That's amazing, right? Uh, and you see, it digitized the way we manufacture stuff, but it went through a long season of deception where this technology didn't seem useful. 
But now we're talking about the disruption of 3D printing. We have 3D printing, printing homes. We have 3D printing, printing chairs and desks and uh, furniture and silverware and almost anything we want. Smartphone cases, they're almost all built by uh, 3D printing machines nowadays. And if you think about that, it's, it's a complete disruption of the whole manufacturer supply chain. Because at some point, we're going to have 3D printing spaces or 3D printing machines spread throughout the globe inside people's home or inside some, some place like a fab lab that is already really common uh, in, in many cities. And I can send my product with my 3D uh, design into that 3D printer, which is close to the customer that I want to sell the product for. So I don't have to have like a global worldwide shipping uh, logistics like crazy. I can simply send the, pro send the production into the closest place from my customer. And that's a complete disruption of several different industries because of 3D printing. So you need to understand that. First, digit digitization. And I, and I ask you, think about yourself. What does your business is digitizing? That's the first question you, you need to do. Then you need to understand, are you exploring a technology that has already gone through the deception phase or are you the one building this technology that is going through a deception phase? You need to understand that. And finally, you get to the disruption almost anyway, okay? Because the more people get used to a technology, uh, the bigger the chance of that technology to, to make a disruption in, in, in the market. Now, what does disruption mean? It means that that technology has the quality to substitute the, the current or the old technology. And in this way, it gains the market. Exactly what happened with Uber, Airbnb, Google, uh, Google against like yellow pages on, on those like phone books and digital camera with Kodak and so on and so forth. And once that happened, we start this, this three stages of, of the technology. The first one is dematerialization. When we're talking about hardware, the hardware becomes smaller and smaller and more capable. Take the digital camera again. This is a 48 megapixel sensor inside the smartphone that has this size. It, it has shrink the size of the sensor. In the past, you can only get 48 megapixels in those big medium format or full, full frame uh, professional cameras. Nowadays, you can have it inside a, a, a smartphone. When we're talking software, what we're usually doing is that we're dematerializing uh, the business model. So instead of having cars, taxi, uh, taxi uh, stops, or things like that, Uber doesn't have anything. It doesn't have the drivers, it doesn't have the car, and so on and so forth. Just like Airbnb and that famous phrase from several years ago that Tom Goodwin said, you know, the largest hotel chain in the world has no hotel room and all this. Now, when we do that, when we dematerialize things, one thing happens. Dematerialization uses less physical uh, assets. We need to have less people, less raw material, then again, less logistics. So we get to the demonetization. If we, if we manage to dematerialize a technology, we will always demonetize the access to that technology, okay? And that's exactly what those examples that I've given before uh, did for us, right? And once you do that, once you have a, a reduction of the costs associated with uh, the access to a certain technology, we get to the democratization. More people have access to that. So 
I don't know. I, I never had one friend who had like a, 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 a driver. And now almost every friend of mine uses Uber. Very few people that I know was used to go to the movies frequently, but many of my friends nowadays use Netflix. I almost never asked for food on, on the weekends. Now I ask for food every weekend, okay, through the delivery platform. So those are the six Ds for the exponential technology and how they're developed. And it's really important that you keep them in mind uh, to understand where you are in this stage, especially if you're bringing a new technology to the market or you're harnessing the power of one of those exponential technologies, you need to be, be clear in which stage the technology you're using inside your project is. And what's really interesting is, is that if we take, for instance, the crypto crypto coin revolution that we're living in right now uh, and we look at bitcoin the first crypto coin uh, what they what it, it was actually done with bitcoin was the digitization now bitcoin started uh, as a small movement of some like uh, enthusiastic uh, early adopters and it went through this deception phase uh, this deceptive phase which you know most people are, are not really, don't really trust in, in Bitcoin as of now. And it also has this problem with like the, the amounts of transactions you can have in, in Bitcoin uh, network. Uh, but more and more companies are getting inside the crypto revolution. And then we have so many other different uh, crypto coins that help you solve some of the Bitcoin problems, but also they add other problems and all this. So now we have this huge pool of, of di digital assets that are fighting for who is going to become like the king uh, for the future in, in this area. But right now we're living in the de deceptive phase of crypto coins. And that's really interesting. We have less than 1% of the global population who has a crypto wallet. Can you think about that? I don't know if you've ever heard or if you have a crypto wallet, but if if kind of like after this talk, you go to, I don't know, Binance or Coinbase and you build your crypto wallet, you're going to be like the top 1% of the global population who has access to crypto coin. Can you believe that? So it's, it's a very, 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 very early stage for this technology. And many people, people compare like today is like 1997 for the internet. We're starting to see the, the big marketplaces coming by. We're starting to see uh, some companies uh, getting bankrupt because they didn't make the best use of crypto, just like we had on the, the WWW revolution back in the days in the 90s. So this is the exact deceptive phase for the Bitcoin. Now, you know what happens next. At some point, Bitcoin and all those crypto coins are going to become the, the real disruption for the financial sector. And not only the financial sector, they open so many other doors, you know, and it's really interesting because those, those like 1% of the population, they're really into that. They're really, they're like not only early adopters, but they're like lovers of this technology. They're, uh, they, they are deeply connected with the purpose of the crypto revolution. So, and, and that's really powerful. And now we're seeing top bankings, firms, top payment systems, and top investors heading towards uh, the crypto revolution. We'll probably see in the upcoming like five or 10 years, a huge disruption in the market that is going to affect governments and all that because governments actually, they live from the financial system of the country, right? And, and I ask you something that I already, already asked for like the biggest economists here in Brazil. We were together during a keynote speak. 
uh, speech and he's a huge influencer in, on LinkedIn. And I asked him, what is the point for me nowadays paying taxes? Because look, I live here in Brazil, but everything that I need to use here in Brazil, I use from private companies, from the road that I'm going through for the, in, for the internet service provider, everywhere I use private companies. My, my insurance plan for my health and my, my little baby, it's a private company. So I use nothing that the government give, might give me. Then, Everything that I use right now is in the cloud. My business is all based on the cloud. I do everything in the cloud. And where is the cloud? Not necessarily here in Brazil. It can be anywhere, right? So I could be moving to anywhere, any place in the world if I want to. I can work, I can live, etc. And I have a transaction mean, which is the crypto wallet, that I can get money from anywhere I want and get it into my wallet in like seconds from anyone, anywhere in the planet. So what's the point of charging taxes? It's, it's really a, a big discussion right now in central banks, in the governments and all this because the crypto revolution is bringing this discussion for the first time. I don't need to use the financial system from my government. Why should I be paying taxes? That, that's a real discussion. We're having this discussion in our OpenEXO community with our consultants uh, that are experts. Uh, central bankings are, ha are having this discussion. So it's going to be a massive disruption. Bear that in mind. But when we see that disruption, it, it's, it's beautiful because Bitcoin and crypto, they dematerialized money, they dematerialized uh, everything. And they also demonetized because the, the fees for me to transfer money to some of you in Malaysia, Asia, it's way less than we were going to pay for like Western Union or on something like that. And it's pretty interesting that El Salvador was the first country to, to adopt Bitcoin, uh, you probably heard the news, and Western Union, which is a famous company to send remittance, send money for different countries, uh, they make almost $400 million a year in revenue just from people sending money into El Salvador, because 23% of El Salvador GDP is based on remittance. Because there are so many uh, people living in the U.S. and sending money to their families in El Salvador. So it's a big disruption. This company, now that El Salvador uh, accepts Bitcoin, and Bitcoin has fees that are way smaller than Western Union, and it's, way, it's much more practical to send the money. You, you just you click a button in, inside your wallet, and, and you simply share the money with someone else that has another wallet. Uh, it's so easy and much cheaper. Western Union is, is risking to lose almost $400 million in revenue yearly. That's crazy. And that's only one company that we're talking about with only one country. Can you imagine this in a global scale? It's going to be a massive transformation. So be prepared for that. But it's also going to be a democratization. I don't know if you know, but the top, if I'm not mistaken, like from the top 10 countries that use, that, that most use internet banking systems, seven of them are in sub-Saharan Africa because they had so much problem on, on the business model of the traditional bank to have banking systems in like faraway villages and tribes, etc. Uh, that uh, a company, a uh, telecom service provider, decided to build an app for people and put their, their communications tower near those, those small villages. And right now, they're, they're the countries that use the most internet banking, and they gave access to people who never saw a bank in their lives. And now what is a bank for them? It's a digital platform. That's really crazy. 
And the other thing that, that is happening with the exponential technology that, that is completely related to the dematerialization is that we're seeing that companies are becoming more lightweight. I don't know if you ever realized that, but have you ever thought about how much does your company weight? Have you ever made this question for yourself? You know, you have yourself, I don't know, I have 70 kilos, kilograms, and I have one laptop with me. I have this desk, I have this chair, and I have a small space here, here in my place that I take like uh, five square meters. So all this is weight into my company. Now take, for example, a, a big industry. They have this massive building, massive machines, and, and then you have like a thousand people moving towards the industry to, to, to go there and work. So you have all those people moving there, but you also have the cars to drive them or, or the buses or the trains and all this. So that makes a very heavy organization. And then you get into the, the organization, every decision you need to make, you need to have a meeting. And to have a meeting, you need to have like 10 people inside a room. And then you have like 700 kilograms of people inside the room to make one decision. And then you need to print something and you need to sign that, that thing printed. So you see, it, it, it becomes like heavier and heavier. And when we start looking at exponential technologies and this dematerialization uh, moment of the framework, of the 6D framework, we realize that companies are becoming more lightweight. So Uber doesn't have any car driver, it doesn't have any car, etc. So it's a much more asset light company. It's a lightweight company. So whenever you need to turn that company and pivot the strategy or make some changes, it's way easier. Whenever you need to make a decision, it's just like a, a Slack message in a channel or a Microsoft Teams uh, hello to someone else. You don't need you don't need to print any paper or sign anything. Maybe it's just an artificial intelligence making decisions for you. Just like YouTube does to approve their videos. So you see, you become a much easier to deal company because you are so lightweight. You're not heavy. You don't have an asset heavy organization. So I, I challenge you to make this question when this event is over, how much does your company weight? Are you putting too much weight in, in, in people around you, in, in the company itself? You know, how, how is the, the weight of your company towards your suppliers, towards your customers? Do you have like several processes and too many steps and all this? And it's very complicated to acquire your service or your product, et cetera. So think about that. How can you make your company more lightweight that's the real goal for for the future and so let's let's take a a, a a quick dive on some of those exponential technologies here's a list that singularity university uh, is always keeping track and there's also the singularity index in the nasdaq uh, stock exchange in the us so you can understand what are the companies that are are like references in those different areas we have 3d printing we have artificial intelligence we have big data we have blockchain we have internet of things the iot we have nanotech we have the neuroscience advancements that we're experiencing we have new energy we have robotics space and virtual reality those are some of the top technologies that we are taking a look and we're closely following because we believe those are the most powerful technologies we have for the for now and for the future for you to have an idea most companies that work with iot they expect we'll have 50 billion devices connected by 2025 50 billion devices connected is 12 times more people more than people are connected into the internet nowadays okay and if I'm not mistaken, we're in, in around 10 billion devices apart from people nowadays, if I'm not mistaken from the last data that I saw. So we're going to increase that, that by fivefold. 
that's a huge business opportunity. What can you connect by using Internet of Things? You know, what are the things that are not connected yet that maybe we can connect in the future? If you see, most of the cars nowadays, their, their keys are not connected. You have like nearby sensors, but they're not like internet connected. And that can be a huge difference for, for us in, in the future. We have seen recently uh, those billionaires going into the space. And now we just saw uh, SpaceX launch the rocket. And it was during a soccer uh, game nearby the launching platform. And everybody was astounded. You know, you see a rocket being launched to outer space and you have five people inside the rocket and none of them as, are astronauts. So in the future, we'll be like traveling out to space. It's so crazy to think, right? So those are the, te the technologies that you should be looking for and you should harness the power inside your own project. Let's take a look in one of them. I don't know if you've ever seen this video before, but it's really scary. Uh, wait. I'm Jim Meskimen. Okay, I... Let's let me see if it works now. Oops, having a problem. So uh, I'll I'll show you. I'm Jim Meskimen, and I wrote a poem about what it feels like to be an impressionist. Is anything more sad and lame, contemptible, beneath disdain? Scary old in man. short, provoking of disgust. Holy sure. And being an impressionist, a third-rate, Robert Niro, fourth-rate skill. The definition of cheap thrill, like watching Probably farm honest. equipment rust, is watching an impressionist. So you got an idea, right? This is a, a deep fake technology. It's based on artificial intelligence, and what it does is it takes images and the voices uh, from recordings of those actors, and it builds their face in in the front of someone else's face. This is this is artificial intelligence. And the artificial intelligence does it by, by itself. So someone coded that, techno that artificial intelligence to say, go out in the internet, find videos of those people and make it like a mask on, on someone else's face. And you get that. So it, it's really amazing and, and scary at the same time, right? Uh, and then we have, uh, when we look, we have like big data that is, a lot of data coming for us, but we also have high frequency, high frequency data nowadays, which is data being looked in, in, in microseconds. So look at the difference for, for like a tennis player. You see a 60 frame per second on, on the left-hand side and 120 frames on the, the right-hand side. And we have this, you know, look at the difference of how we can manage COVID uh, because we have this data. And this data is like high frequency data. We have some countries that are updating by the minute this map on, on around uh, the COVID pandemics. So it, it's a completely different world because now we can track data on, on the spot, on real time. And I was uh, accommodating a friend here uh, in my place for a few days. And he works in a big uh, corporation here in Brazil. And he was here doing a three days report to send to the company's executives. Can you believe that? That's really boring, you know, to, to download all the data from the system, et cetera. And it, when you go to a startup or something like that, you have real time data. You don't need to build reports. The reports are being built as long as we ha you have new data. If you have data by the second, you have new charts and new graphs coming by the second. It's really a different world. We have right now synthetic biology. This is a photo from, from the Pacific garbage uh, patch. And what is synthetic biology? We're, we're changing genetics from several different uh, materials and, and living beings. And recently, a, a group of, of researchers, they, they managed to build a new enzyme that goes inside, you know, those water, I forgot the name, is that the, it's kind of like water plants, 
So those plants get the en enzyme and that enzyme is capable of uh, digesting plastics. So we can like solve the, the, the problem with ocean pollution, uh, not by trying to take the plastic out of the ocean, but also, but by making the, 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 the sea plant digest plastic. That is crazy, right? But we're living in this world. And now you have like lab grown meat. We have companies like Illumina. Illumina makes the machine to sequence DNA. And every system that makes DNA sequencing nowadays uses Illumina uh, hardware. And as you can see, when, when they start out, nobody believed in them. But right now, they're experiencing an exponential growth in their market uh, value. Uh, we have like technologies like YOLO that I showed you on, on, on the first uh, event here that by in real time, it understands what are the different objects that it's looking for. So you have computer vision in, uh, in high quality. And we have seen this, those technologies being used by several different companies. They're completely disrupting industries. And here's an, a nice chart about the, 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 the manufacturing, car manufacturing companies. And it's quite astonishing because by 2005, we have Toyota with $200 billion market cap. And I'll, I'll move forward. And we'll see that we start seeing Tesla and suddenly, boom, Tesla explodes. And why is that? It's not because Tesla is working with renewable energy, but it's actually, uh, yeah, it, it, it's sci-fi now. It's, it's, really, it's really crazy, right? And, and the fact that Tesla grew so much, its, it's stock is not related to the energy revolution they're trying to build but actually of the artificial intelligence revolution, they are already building because their cars are so advanced in the autonomous system that probably no other manufacturer, car manufacturer will ever get to them because they have now, right now, millions of cars riding every day in an autonomous mode. And with this autonomous mode, their artificial intelligence is becoming more and more intelligent so the other guys can, can get to them because they have so many years of millions of cars riding uh, all over the US and all over the world, you know? So the other manufacturers have no chance. That's why investors are pouring money into Tesla and not into other, uh, other companies. And we have this move from like crowdsourcing, you know, you can crowdfund material uh, projects with your money, but you can also crowdsource your knowledge. Uh, and, but right now we're experiencing the crime sourcing movement. And it's really crazy. Uh, a few years back, uh, a hacker managed to hack an ATM system in, in Europe. And through the, the gateway that he managed to, to break uh, inside that ATM, he managed to connect with like thousands of ATMs around uh, Europe. And he posted that in a hacker channel in the internet. And he said, at this day, I'm going to open the gateway so you guys can go inside those ATMs. And they managed to strip $350 million in 10 minutes from thousands of ATMs spread all over the world, right? Another like crazy sci-fi story, but that we're living in. And I don't know if you've ever seen this story, but it's really funny. Alexa is, is selling a lot nowadays and it, it has almost 90 million people in the US right now have an Alexa device. It's really an exponential technology. Voice user interface is the future of user interface and all this. And it's, it, it's a very funny story because a little girl, a few years back, she, bought, she, she asked Alexa to buy a dollhouse for her. So she said, Alexa, buy me a dollhouse and I want uh, a car for my doll. I want this and that. 
And when her mother realized she, she made a $800 purchase at, at Amazon website. So that became a big news in the area, in, in her region. She went to the local TV and she was like complaining about Amazon and all this. So they made this story and this story showed in this channel. And the TV news uh, anchor, by the end of the news, she said, I can't believe that uh, that the girl said, Alexa, buy me a dollhouse. And Alexa bought the dollhouse. Now, when the TV anchor said that, several Alexas that were listening to the TV, they bought the dollhouse for like almost 200 homes in that region of this uh, of this TV channel news. It, it was so funny, you know? It's crazy things that are, that are going on going on all over the world. Why? Because of the power of those exponential technologies. Now, the question is, how do I become a company that harness this, this power? So as you know, we built this platform for you to make a good, good use of it. And, and here, here is, is the, the link to, to, to this board. Uh, Rosalind just shared with everybody that is in, in this Zoom call. And how do you navigate here? First, uh, you can zoom in and zoom out. So whenever, wherever you're pointing or anything that you click, uh, you're going to zoom around that, okay? So you can zoom in and zoom out. If you're using the scroll on your, uh, on your the, the touchpad inside your, your laptop, uh, you, you, do, you do like the pinch movement, just like smartphones. Uh, if you're using the smartphone on your screen, you also do that. But if you're using like the mouse, you can scroll up and down or in the bottom right, you have this percentage and you have a, a zoom in and zoom out button. So you can click more, you can click less, so you can zoom in. And then you can navigate. There are two ways to navigate. When this arrow is blue, you, you can navigate with your fingers in your touchpad if you're using the touchpad. If not, you can click outside and you get this little hand and you click and you move the board right and left, up and down and so on and so forth, okay? So this is the basic navigation inside Miro. But what I built here for you is to really understand the EXO framework. And how are you going to navigate here if there's so many like different colors? Where do I start and all this? So this two in the bottom left, you have this little menu over here. It might be like this, or it might be like this for you, open or closed. And when you open it, it has this frames resource feature. And these frames organize the content for you. So I organize the content for you. And you move, in the way that I believe you need to learn the exponential organization uh, concept so you can have a better understanding of it. Now, how does the exponential framework uh, goes? First, you have the MTP. We have spoken about that before. It was our last conversation, the focus on the massive transformative purpose, how your brand is the mentor of a hero's journey and this was all explored in our last conversation. And now you have those two acronyms and, and you see something weird. I just realized before we start this conversation is that we have the scale uh, acronym and we have the ideas acronym. And in this uh, material over here, uh, I have the ideas on the right hand side because of the left right brain uh, concept where you have the right brain is the creativity uh, brain, the, the brain for creativity, the, the part of the brain that takes care of creativity. So you have the ideas acronym. It makes sense. But then when we were building this concept and all this, we also realized there's another uh, strategic tool, very famous called the business model canvas. And the business model canvas has the customer to the right hand side. So as you see in, in, in the bottom part here, I have the scale on the right and ideas on the left. And that was a mistake on, on my part. So, but, but it was kind of like everything was built already. I didn't want to spoil and move everything around, you know? 
So I left like this. And what is the concept? The SCALE acronym. And we're going to be using this, uh, this part of the, the platform. The SCALE uh, attributes, they're related to how you connect with your customers. That's why here they're, they're on the right side because they're connected with the business model canvas. And the business model canvas has the customer and the value proposition for the right, right hand side. And the ideas acronym takes care of how you work with exponential technologies in order to bring solutions into your customers. And that's exactly what it shows on the business model canvas where you have all the operation side on the left hand side. Okay, so that's the first thing for you guys to for you uh, audience to understand. Now, the scale acronym uh, it stands for staff on demand, Uber drivers. It, it's, it's a way for you to have third party uh, service providers into your company, community and crowd. It's how you connect to your community or how you make uh, products and services that harness the power of the crowd. You have algorithms, and we're going to understand what an alg algorithm really means. You have leverage assets. So using third-party assets to build your own project, like Airbnb does with its the hosts and their places for you to stay. And finally, engagement, how you, you maintain people engaged with your uh, project. Now, what do I recommend for any company that wants to work with the exponential framework? Is once you build your MTP, and if you remember the last conversation we have, and if you don't, didn't see it, go back to it, it's going to be really powerful for you to grasp the exponential uh, organization framework. When we're building the MTP, the first thing we think is about our the hero in, in the journey. And we come as a company, as their mentor. Now, if I build my purpose thinking about the impact I want to build on people, the first attribute I need to check it out is community and crowd. How can I make this connection between my purpose and people? And how can I impact that community? That's the first step you need to take in my perception. Originally, when you build this, this, this exponential framework and you start using that for your business, we usually say, okay, you can start with whatever you like. You need to improve on those dimensions of the attributes. And if you have four attributes in your company, you, 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 you start experiencing an exponential growth. But what I believe is actually that you need to connect with the community. If you don't connect to the community, you will hardly experience any exponential growth. Actually, if you, don't, if you have like four attributes well built on the left hand side, but you on the idea side, but you don't have any attribute on the scale side, you hardly scale. So in order to balance that, I'm kind of like proposing a guide for the exponential organizations framework. And this guide starts with your community. Who are the people you are serving? How do you connect with them? Who is part of the community is going to have an active role? And who is part of the crowd? How can you access the crowd? So let's take, for example, Waze the GPS uh, app. GP Waze works with crowd data sourcing. So everyone that has its phone, turn it on with the geolocalization, uh, the GPS, turn it on. You're already building data for ways to work with. So you're part of the crowd of people bringing data into uh, Waze. And that's how Waze determines if the traffic is going well or not. Now, there's a second level. Once you're in like a highway and there's a car stopped a few kilometers uh, in, in front of you and Waze tells you, hey, there's a car stopped on the road. And then he asks a question, is it true or is it not? Then if you answer that question, you become part of Waze's community. 
because you're helping the crowd to have a better experience inside uh, the traffic jam. So the first thing you need to understand is who is your customer, who is your community, and how you connect with them and how you serve them, right? And what are their needs? The best tool that I know for that is the value proposition design, which is a topic for uh, another conversation. And I also know that Magic has already ran some uh, events around this concept of the value proposition design. The other thing you need to understand is how you bring innovators into your MTP, your purpose, and how you acquire early adopters. That's the second step. Because once you have early adopters, then you start going, you, you can start making experiments inside your project and really make them grow. And I also added here, so you can move just like I'm moving here, going back and forth, but you can also be on using the frames uh, content. So you click here, you click here, and then you click here, you get to the crossing the chasm concept. And here we have a very good concept, a few videos that I got for you uh, that talks about building a business around a community. And that, those are really powerful concepts. I have here the, the Pierce concept from, from Robin Chase. She was the, the, the founder of uh, Zipcar, which is the first uh, car sharing platform in the world. We also have the New Power, which is a profound book, the best book I read in the last five years. And we also have Tribes. So all those videos help you understand the power of community and how you can build a business based on the community. Now, once you understand your community, if you move here, you, you're gonna get to algorithms. And you're probably thinking, what does my community has anything to do with algorithms? Well, actually algorithms, let's see this description, is a set of rules that precisely defines a sequence of operations. So in the first, event on, on, on this uh, series that we're doing here, I was mentioning about uh, the experience of going to, to a din dinner. So I go out, I choose my food, I choose my restaurant, I decide the way I'm going to the restaurant, then I decide if I need to park or not, then I get the table, uh, and then I, I get the menu, I make the order, I eat, I pay, and so on and so forth. And I was comparing that to the experience that Uber food and, and grab food, Uber Eats and grab food and uh, DoorDash, they bring to their customer. And uh, now this is actually an algorithm. This is a set of rules that precisely defines a sequence of operations for you to get dinner outside your, your, your place, right? But that is also called a customer journey. So your community's algorithm is actually your customer journey. Well, the first thing you need to understand, who is your customer? Who is the community you're trying to uh, bring value to? And once you define that, you need to understand what are their, their journey with the challenge you're trying to solve. And once you understand that, you have your customer journey. Now, you understand your customer journey, you also see that the sales funnel is a set of rules to make you sell more. It's the same concept. The sales funnel, whether you use the IDA concept, awareness, interest, decision, and action, whether you use the pirate metrics that from Dave McClure, acquisition, activation, retention, referral, re revenue, or you use the, the format that Steve Blanks proposes with acquire, activate, keep customer, upsell, next sell, cross sell, referral. Any of those models, they are what? A set of rules that define, that precisely defines a sequence of operations for you to sell more. Now, once you, you understand those two initial concepts, you can come here into interfaces that you see is on the other side of the exponential framework. And the interface is where you add the exponential technology because it's the interface attribute 
that is going to help you solve your customer's algorithm. So you have your community, they have a journey. You're going to try to help them have a better journey, just like DoorDash and GrabFood and Uber Eats did with the experience of, the, of going outside to dinner. And what, what did they do? They used several exponential technologies like your smartphone, the GPS, uh, APIs to integrate with uh, the system, the, the restaurant system, the payment system, and all this. So they use this, this set of uh, exponential technologies to build a new interface for you to have dinner, which is DoorDash, which is GrabFood, Uber Eats, and so on and so forth. And when you think about new interfaces, interfaces inside the exponential organization framework is all, all about leveraging and making your company grow. And when we think about interfaces, one of the best examples that I know is from Alipay. Alipay just moved $17 trillion in mainland China alone, and PayPal processed $720. To 12 billion. It's a massive difference. And as you can see here, almost every service that a Chinese person needs, it's inside Alipay. So you have digital interface with exponential technologies empowering the Chinese people's lives. That's why I think this, this, this solution is so powerful. So those are the first three steps that I recommend you to take and to uh, learn from this, uh, from this map uh, to really harness the, the, the power of the exponential organizations. Understand your MTP, we had the last video. Understand exponential technologies, connect with your community, define their algorithm, their customer journey, the set of rules that they live by to solve their challenge. And finally, empower them by using an exponential technology to transform their algorithms, their customer journey. And that's how we finish this day. On the upcoming days, we'll see how the other uh, attributes get connected and how you can actually build an exponential organization because we have a lot of culture to, to, uh, to challenge. We have a lot of internal challenges inside our corporation that needs to be uh, surpassed so we can uh, actually build an exponential organizations.